<laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, uh, good to see everybody. Are we hanging in there? It's extra readings today <laughs> for Purim. And as we, uh, you know, move into this season. Um, but I do have what I think is a very interesting message today. So hopefully we can stay alert and um, stretch a little bit. And what we're going to do is we're, we're getting close to finishing our, se- our series on Ephesians. And um, I, I kind of want to finish the book. I'm moving through. We're almost at the end. I think this is number 10 of the series. And um, I'm excited about it. Today we're going to discuss a passage that's very familiar to many of us called the armor of God. And this is in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. Uh, We've covered a lot of ground in the Ephesians series so far. And uh, I'll just touch on what we need to to frame the passage for today. Uh, It's critical that we remember that the big picture of this book is that Ephesians is about the identity and life of a community in Messiah. The identity and life of a community in Messiah. In Messiah, Paul says that we are a part of a renewed humanity, to live out the great Jewish hope. We're called to assume our royal calling in Messiah. We are called to be children of God, the great King. In our last message a few weeks ago, we went into some detail on how a husband and a wife need to submit to one another in love, and we are to stand apart, to put off things like anger and greed and selfishness, to be clothed with love and joy and kindness and characterized by thanksgiving and joy. Mm. Ephesians experienced pressures from all directions in their day to compromise their faith. Uh, They experienced pressures to compromise their renewed humanity that Paul is calling them to. So like us, they experienced temptations from the world around them to revert back to the idols of their lives. To give in to selfish living, temptations towards strife, temptations to divide and to isolate and to just go it on your own, temptations to uh, give up their faith in Yeshua uh, for the materialistic things of this world. Even more, they faced Roman persecution for their identity in Yeshua. They were being persecuted. They were being killed for their testimony of hope. And this is why Paul concludes his letter Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then he tells us how to resist so that we don't undermine Messiah's unity in his community or compromise our new royal humanity that he has called us to be part of. Now, Paul's plan has three parts. The first part is to recognize our true spiritual enemy. The second part is to put on our spiritual armor of the Messianic King, where he draws from Isaiah, images from Isaiah of the Messianic King. And then the third is to pray in all ways at all times. What we're going to do is today, we're just going to look at part one of Paul's plan. Next week, we'll close out our Ephesians series with part two and part three, the armor of the Messianic King. So let's read verses 10 through 13, and we'll, that's what we'll cover today. Uh, verse 10 in Ephesians, we're in Ephesians 6, verse 10. I don't have slides today because it's just a short verse. If you'd like to look it up, I'll read it right now too. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you are able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the worldly forces of darkness and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist when times are evil, and after you have done everything to stand firm. Sounds like that applies to today, doesn't it? Well, um, how many of you have experienced, felt like you've experienced some kind of real evil spiritual forces, you know, not just metaphorical kinds of evil, but like experience evil in your life. Most of you have experience of some kind. Um, on Shabbat, you know, at, at Rook on Shabbat, we, we tend to focus on what God is doing more than on evil. Um, nevertheless, uh, we need to recognize that these darker spiritual forces do exist. They're not just metaphors. They're real powers of wickedness. 
And so I don't normally, we don't normally talk about demons and stuff like that here, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it today because it's in the passage and it's so important for us to be aware of. I remember a day, uh, this became very real to me, uh, over a decade ago, years ago, and, and this isn't about anyone here, but we were launching our prayer team, the Tefila team, some of you remember, and I, I did a prayer session with someone for outside of the congregation who came in, and we were praying, and we were just doing some inner healing and stuff, and all of a sudden her eyes rolled back and she started growling with this otherworldly voice that wasn't from her. And at that time I was like, what do I do? <laughs> I didn't know what to do. So that's when we said, hey, we need to get some training in this. If we're going to be digging stuff up in the prayer room, we need to get some training. So that's how we started that whole process with our prayer team. You know, for Yeshua and the disciples and for the early community of Yeshua, healing from demonic spirits was a part of regular life. Um, it, you know, it, it was in the, it's in the Basur all the time. They're constantly healing people by freeing them from bondage to evil. In Luke 4, 31, uh, we read, In the synagogue there was a man who had a demon, an evil spirit. The man cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us? Yeshua of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Yeshua said sternly. Come out of him. And then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring them. And all the people were amazed. Uh, then it says, At sunset, Yeshua, People were brought to Yeshua of various sicknesses and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people. You kind of read over these, like gloss over them, you know, what did it mean? Well, in Luke 9, Yeshua sends his disciples to drive out evil spirits and to heal diseases and sicknesses. So big, big picture for Yeshua, and this is the same for Paul in Ephesians, for Yeshua, Getting rid of demonic spirits is simply one part of healing, one part of refuah hanefesh, one part of healing the soul. And the biblical concept of deliverance, you know, people talk about deliverance. The, the biblical concept of deliverance is God's salvific and redeeming work in our world for Israel and for the nations. That's what deliverance is. It's not just casting out a spirit or something. Deliverance is this big picture his saving plans for the world, for Israel and the nation. But when Yeshua dislodges a demonic spirit in the Basara, it's a sign of the great Jewish hope. The kingdom of God is breaking in. The kingdom of Satan is being destroyed. That's the message. The kingdom of God is breaking in. The kingdom of Satan is being destroyed. So, who is Satan or Satan? Uh, Paul is telling us in this passage that we need to understand our real spiritual enemy in order to stand strong in our royal spiritual calling. Now, the term devil is derived from the Greek diabolos, or slanderer, and then satan is Hebrew for adversary. Uh, Hasatan, you'll hear sometimes, means the adversary. Satan appears about 23 times in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the serpent who tricked Adam and Eve into eating from the forbidden tree. We all imagine from the children's Bibles a cute cartoon talking snake, you know. Um, and we wonder, why were they deceived by that? But the Hebrew doesn't necessarily mean snake. Nakasha can mean um, to hiss or an evil whisper or an enchanter. Uh, so in Jewish tradition, the Nakash who spoke to Adam might have been a beautifully looking spiritual being, not just a talking snake. The Nakash is associated with Satan. Satan is a key figure in the story of Job, of course, where he actually asks God for permission to plague Job as a test of his integrity. In Zechariah 3, 1 through 2, Satan appears next to Joshua, the high priest, to accuse him, and the Lord rebukes him. In 1 Chronicles 21, 1, Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. And now I'm sure you've heard the term Lucifer, uh, Lucifer. The term Lucifer comes from Latin Christian translation of the Hebrew word Hallel, Hallel, used in Isaiah 14, 12. And Hallel is translated the shining one, or sometimes the morning star is sometimes how it's translated, a shining star in heaven. And here's the verse. How you have fallen from heaven, Hallel, shining one, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who were once laid low. The nations. Now, in context, this passage is probably talking about the king of Babylon, 
He's the one who's the shining one who's being laid low in the context of the book. But then in the books of Enoch, Enoch is a, a Jewish uh, apocalyptic book from the second temple period written before Yeshua's day. And Enoch interprets the shining one in Isaiah as one who has fallen from heaven as a glorious angel who rebelled and was cast out of heaven, Hasatan. It's very interesting. The passage goes like this in 2 Enoch. One of the ranks of the archangels conceived an impossible thought to place his throne higher than the clouds above the earth that he might become equal in rank to the Lord's power. And the Lord threw him out from the heights with his angels and he was flying in the air continuously above the bottomless. That's Enoch. Now, Enoch was excluded from the Jewish and later Christian canon of Scripture for the most part. There's some small groups that see it as Scripture. But it was well-known text by Jews in the Second Temple period, and they quoted from it regularly. And interestingly enough, the Besora reflects some of these traditions. And these reflect very early Jewish traditions as well. So in the Besora, in the New Testament, the book of Jude 1 quotes from the book of Enoch. And this particular tradition is affirmed by the apostles. So in Luke 10, verses 17 through 18, Yeshua says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, Paul says, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And in Yochanan 12, 31, John 12, 31, we read, The prince of this world will be driven out. And then back to Ephesians earlier on in Ephesians 2, Paul says, You followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You hear reflections of Enoch in that, the spirit of the air, the one who's floating around the air. Okay, so that's Hasatan. What are, what are demons? Well, according to tradition in 2 Enoch, when Satan led his rebellion in heaven, he gathered a large number of angels to follow him. And when he was cast down to roam the earth, these angels went along with him. So we see in, also in the book of Revelation uh, 12, verse 9, we read, The great dragon, that would be Satan, was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads a whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth, with his angels with him, with his helpers with him, we might say. So uh, according to these traditions, demonic spirits or evil spirits are really fallen angels in rebellion. Uh, now the good news is that God has also sent many good angels, malachim, to come and to help us and to be around us. And they're all over the place, but that's another message. Um, when Yeshua freed people from evil spirits... Yeshua was not dealing with Satan himself, but these angels who were in rebellion. These are like Satan's helpers. They're his servants, and they seem to have various different abilities, uh, names, roles, and different kinds of powers. For example, in, Sa in Samuel chapter 18, an evil spirit is sent to harass King Saul. Now, some Jews take that metaphorically. Uh, I take it very literally. <laughs> There's an evil spirit that comes that's harassing him. We read in Mark 5, we read a remarkable story. There, there's a man who uh, has an impure spirit that seems to have totally possessed the man, and he's in chains, and even the chains can't contain him. He keeps breaking the chains. He lives in the tombs, and he cries out, and he cuts himself with stones. And Yeshua comes, and the spirit says, you know, what would you have with me? And he says, you know, Yeshua says, what is your name? It's very interesting. He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. A legion was a body of soldiers in Rome that might have consisted of 6,800, actually 6,826 men was a legion. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> so they beg Yeshua to cast them into the pigs that were grazing. But it wasn't just a few pigs. It was 2,000 pigs. So 2,000 pigs, and Yeshua says, yes, go which is strange to me. I don't understand it. But he said, go. and tells them to go to the pigs. They go to the pigs. And what do they do? They charge off the bank and drown themselves in the lake. And this causes quite a stir because 2,000 pigs is, I mean, that's like, that's like income for everybody. <laughs> you know, and it's gone. Um, and so 
anyway, after this, the man is normal and is in his, his right mind. He's normal. He's wearing clothes again. So put all these things together. We've learned a few important things about our spiritual enemy. First is that Satan, Hasatan, is capable of appearing as an angel of light. Think of that. It's not just the, the horns and the red face and the tail. You know, he's capable of appearing as an angel of light. But his real intention is to destroy you. I hate to say it on Shabbat. His real intention is to destroy you and the kingdom of God. And so we need to be careful because I would imagine that he can appear stunning. He can appear tempting. It might appear as good in order to lead us astray ever so gently. So be careful of things that appear good, especially in big global context. It may not be. We need to be careful. Paul warns us um, to stand strong against the schemes of Hasatan. He is the father of lies, and he loves to tell half-truths. He gets a bit of truth in there that is true, but then he mixes it with something else that will come out later that is not quite that way. Okay. Second, we see that Satan is very powerful and that he has come, he has some form of dominion over this world. And I think that's very interesting. It isn't just that we're in this territory, uh, the, the world where everything that happens is God's will. Satan is called the prince of this world. Paul refers to demons associated with the kingdom of Satan as rulers and as powers and worldly forces of darkness and spiritual forces of wickedness, even in the heavenly places. So these powers are in the world, and they've taken root, involving themselves behind the scenes in human affairs, from daily interactions on an individual level in our lives to manipulating nations and governments towards the diabolical cause, destruction of God's plan for humanity. Now, it isn't that the world is bad. That's not the idea. But I like how C.S. Lewis describes this, that we are in enemy-occupied territory. The world is filled with corruption. It's good, very good, but it's filled with corruption. So when we pray, your will be done on earth, here in enemy-occupied territory, just as it is in heaven, we're saying, God, come and make things right in our broken world. And this is why Yeshua came. I mean, this is ultimately the greatest Jewish hope there is, that in this covert operation, he comes and he takes on every bit of the brokenness of the world for us. So we live in a world that's ruled by these terrible powers, but we know the true king. We're on his team. And so our job is to stand strong as members of God's royal kingdom. We're supposed to stand out. And I think it's critical perspective for understanding the bad things that happen in this world. You know, God isn't the one causing children to suffer and starvation around the globe and disaster around the world. God isn't the one causing military conflict around the globe today. God isn't the one causing your loved ones to suffer through cancer and through disease. God's not responsible for the pain and suffering and the brokenness of the world. God is the one leading the rescue team. We need to understand that Satan is our real enemy. This is what Paul wants us to see in this passage. We need to understand the mind of our enemy. Satan knows that God will win, but he embodies pure evil for its own sake. It's like Satan is just waiting out his term, trying to do as much evil as he can to lead as many people astray. So he's motivated by hatred for God and everything God loves, and his goal is destruction. That's it. The Ephesians struggled with many problems, from selfishness that Paul talks about, to greed, to idolatry, to global persecution from the huge Roman military system. Paul wants us to know that it's really one enemy. In his words, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Our real enemy is not the problems and the circumstances we interact with in this world. A real enemy, in Paul's language, is the rulers and the powers and the worldly forces of darkness and the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, Hasatan and his minions who follow his instructions. So Satan wants to destroy nations. He's working towards uh, getting rid of anything that's good and sowing seeds of war across the earth. 
This is relevant to our day. He wants to do the same things in our communities, to bring confusion, to bring division and hurt. He wants to break up marriages. He wants to break up families, and he wants to blame us. He wants each of us to blame each other for these problems. Now, I don't mean that Satan is directly behind every disagreement that we have with our spouse. That's really important. Uh, we're very capable as humans of selfishness and great hurt. And none of this uh, absolves people for responsibility to act rightly. We're supposed to act rightly in the midst of all of this. And I think that sometimes the demonic will take root in our own sins and turn up the volume, making them more compulsive, and more deeply embedded within us. But ultimately, even though we, we still have to deal with rights and wrongs, and we're still accountable to do the right thing, ultimately our spouse isn't the enemy. The people who have wronged us and that we can't forgive aren't the enemy. Satan is the enemy. Now, in Revelation 12, 9, we see good news. Hasatan has already been defeated. He's already been defeated. It's just a matter of time. Yeshua has complete authority over the prince of this world. And in Yeshua's merit, we have access to this authority. Now, this isn't just theology. I, I want to say this is very real. Uh, and, and I think that it's very important that we take ownership of this authority and learn how to, how to do some of these things. Um, I'll just give you an example, a couple of examples. Uh, we had a, a, remember the healing conference we had here back in 2016, 17. We did a couple and uh, there was a, a neat story. One person came up for prayer, not, not from here, who was struggling with tinnitus. She'd had ringing in her ears and headaches for decades. And so, you know, she's like, well, how can I pray? Well, I don't know. Let's just pray, <laughs> you know, and let's listen. And this doesn't happen all the time, you know, but, um, and this certainly isn't the cause of tinnitus globally, you know, but in this case, I don't know, I just had this sense of electricity kind of come in right here like this, this sense came over me. And this word, curse, just kind of came in, into me while we were praying. So I said, hey, um, I, just, I could be wrong. I could be making this thing up. It's kind of weird, but I have this sense that there may be a curse or something involved. Does that mean anything to you? And she said, yes. You know, I, I did this mission trip a couple decades ago, and there was this person who said they put a curse on me, but I just never, I just forgot about it and moved on. So I was like, well, why don't we try? Who knows? So we just prayed to break this thing. And it was, it was kind of a simple thing. She had like a breath out and felt lighter, and the ringing and the headache went away. I was like, great, okay, that's awesome. Let me know how it is in a couple weeks. So we followed up a couple weeks, it was better. And then a year later, I uh, spoke to this person at another conference at, out in Connecticut, and um, she said it's still better. And I thought that was really neat. So who knows? Again, it doesn't mean that everything, that, that like a curse or some demonic powers is behind every sickness, although globally, in the end, sickness comes from the enemy, doesn't it? Um, but in this case, that was really important. Another uh, situation that I, I thought was really neat um, was that at Camp Rolador, this was years ago, uh, we, there was a, a teen who came, um, again, he's not a teen anymore, so it's gone, who came from prayer after the, during the healing service and afterwards came up to talk to me saying, you know, I'm struggling right now because I feel like I can't sleep and I have this oppression over me and I just feel heavy and it's depressed, and I don't know what to do about it, and there were struggles going on at home and things like that. And there's a dozen different ways we could approach this, but uh, we just said, you know what, why don't we pray, and I'm going to teach you how to pray these deliverance prayers so that you can get rid of anything that's there if there's anything there. So we did. We just taught him how to, I brought another person over. We taught him how to do this, and it was amazing. He, he, he said these prayers. He owned it, and then he looked up, and like this light came over his face, and he looked up, and he said, wow, that's amazing. I can run a mile. It was really cute. And, and it was like something lifted from him. You know, there was some power that lifted from him. In the name of Yeshua and by his authority, I command you, spirit, whatever spirit is, to leave now. And we see this, those words even spelled out in Acts chapter 16. So if you felt this, if you felt like a heavy presence keeping you from sleep at night, it, it might be a spirit. It might be a demonic presence. Uh, and I would always suggest praying deliverance prayers for that kind of thing. Um, uh, before you look to the purely psychological. We, all, we bring in the psychological too. You know what I mean? We're not like one or the other. We do both. But always bring that in and think about it. And from personal experience, I've come to see, I think that most nightmares are rooted in the demonic. That's just, I'm, 
maybe not all of them, but I think most nightmares are actually rooted in the demonic and can be got rid of by deliverance prayer and taking on authority. So if you're having nightmares, if your kids are having nightmares or night terrors, um, you need to pray deliverance prayers and you need to teach the kids how to take the ownership of their faith, utilize God's power in their life to get rid of this stuff um, because you don't have to put up with it in your house. And people put up with it for decades and decades. Uh, one time, a few years ago, we took the family to, this was a lot more than a few years ago. <laughs> we took, and the kids were a little, we took the family out to this cabin. I thought it'd be a great idea to get a cabin that we had to hike into. And we got our backpacks and we went out there and went out to this beautiful log, one little cabin with a wood stove. And when we got there, it was like there were these little statues of Buddha and Hindu idols all over the cabin. And we're like, oh, what do we do? So we turned them over. We prayed protection, and we just said, whatever, we'll just be fine. Uh, so anyway, the whole time, we bickered, the entire time. Like, like we just fought with each other. It was like the worst vacation I think I've ever been on. We, I had a, a, a headache the whole time. We couldn't sleep. The temperature was never right in the room. And uh, we prayed lots of protection, but it was just like there was something there <laughs> we were in. So we get home, and um, the next night after we got home, Chaim, he, he said I could share this story. I asked him. He woke up with this terrible night terror. I mean, he was like, it, it was the worst of night terrors. And uh, so we went in, and I, I felt led to pray, oh, there you are, that this was like something, this was something from this cabin. And so we just took ownership of it. We prayed deliverance. We taught you how to pray deliverance. And it left. And that night terror never came back. Later on, I got an email from the woman who ran the house saying, this, the cabin enjoyed your stay. I was like, ew. <laughs> I don't know what that meant, but it, was, it just felt ew to me, you know. Anyway, I wonder, like, if we hadn't known, because, you know, by God's grace, we knew how to do this. If we didn't know that, that could have stayed in our home for, 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 for 10 years and affecting so many other areas and become, become a, a root, a stronghold of, of problems in our home that we wouldn't even know what it was. doesn't mean all problems in family life are because of a demon. That isn't the case, but that could be the way. could be something that's going on there. Anyway, learn these prayers. It's really important. Learn how to do this. We can help. Um, talk to me if you're having a problem. We could do a whole conference on this, and I'm not going to do that now. Uh, this is a challenging topic to bring up, but we don't talk about it all the time here in the service because it might come across as unbalanced. And the last thing I'd want you to do is take away from this that evil spirits run our lives so that we need to let them have this unhealthy role in our lives. C.S. Lewis said that you don't look for a demon under every rock, but you also don't want to ignore them altogether. I think of it like taking out the trash. Uh, we don't want to spend our lives thinking about trash, but we do need to learn how to take out the trash when it piles up, you see? Um, Yaakov says in his letter, submit yourselves to God. That's the first part. And then resist the devil and he will flee from you. So it isn't an automatic thing. We have to resist in our world and fight for the good. Um, I'm going to close today with uh, what I think are the two most important principles to help us fight this battle. Uh, the first is that we have to come and walk in the authority that we have in Yeshua. So this is really critical if you can get this. The demonic feeds on fear. So they, they literally shrink and diminish with confidence in authority in Yeshua. But they get bigger with fear. They feed off of our fear. And that's what they, they really can't hurt you, but they can make you afraid. And, and that can de sow destruction in your life. So more than words, more than what words you say, it's that you understand the authority that you've been given in Yeshua if you walk with him. Your authority is like an elephant compared to the demon that's like a little mosquito. And you need to see it that way. And when you see it that way, you just flick them away. And it's not a big deal. Otherwise, it's a big deal. But you've got to have that authority. Flick them away. In 1 John 3, 8, we read, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Again, the great Jewish hope. So these evil spirits do have a great deal of power. On our own, we don't have much power over them. But with Yeshua, they tremble. Bad news that these spirits are there. People don't know it. They don't know what's wrong, and, and we have to deal with it. Good news is that Yeshua is with us, and he's given us the power and the authority, and then empowered us to release those who are in bondage, and like Yeshua, to set the captives free. 
The second principle that's very important is that Paul's message here is not about demons. It's about focusing on becoming more godly in every area of our lives. Uh, Another kind of story that he said I could share, because it was a long time ago, it was when he was five, I was trying to explain to him how Yeshua's authority protects us from evil and how he can uh, cast out the demonic from his uh, room and how he could, you know, fight Satan. And he was like, uh, he stood up on his bed and he said, I want to be on Yeshua's team so I can fight Satan. And I said, that's great. You can start by obeying your dad and brushing your teeth. And I think that's really important because that's Paul's plan. We fight the kingdom and rulers of Satan by doing what's right and by bringing God's order back into our hearts and our homes and our community. At the core of the authority we have in Messiah is an inner strength. It's, it's the, the midot of inner integrity, of character and hope that we develop as we say yes to God and as we follow his ways. So God's strategy for fighting here is that we clothe ourselves with the armor of truth, of righteousness, of peace, of faith, of redemption, of God's Torah, with prayer of all kinds. We know our true king has come into the land. And he's gathering an army of followers that means that we have a spiritual battle to fight. Paul's message to us in Ephesians is that you are children of God. You're part of a renewed humanity, a great work that God is doing in the world. And it requires that we put off the things of the dying world, that we put off the selfishness and the greed and the anger and the control. And instead we put on Righteous, living, love, giving of ourselves in an effort to live like Messiah. So we need to know our enemy so that we can put on the good king's armor, the spiritual armor that bears the name of King Messiah, the armor of God. Next week we'll get into what this kingly armor looks like. So today... Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Shabbat shalom.